Around 5,000 years ago, one of the largest and most powerful empires in history emerges on the banks of the Nile. Ancient Egypt. Monumental temples, tombs and metropolises bear witness to the power of this fascinating civilization. Yet Egyptian culture is also considered strange and mysterious to this day. International researchers explain the world of the godlike pharaohs and the everyday life of their subjects. The Egyptian empire endured for 3,000 years. What is the secret of success of this advanced civilization on the Nile? The women of ancient Egypt. Little is known about them today, yet they played a significant role in 3,000 years of the empire's history. You see a kind of female ruler arise several times. Strong, self-confident women with all avenues open to them. Their self-confidence impresses their contemporaries. This is their story. Ancient Egypt. To many, it's the success story of powerful men. Women usually appear only in marginal roles. Yet one of ancient Egypt's most famous figures isn't a man, but a woman, Cleopatra. Not just in the palace, but throughout the empire, women hold high positions in the social hierarchy. Ancient Egypt played a pioneering role in matters of equality. We know that women could definitely make their own decisions. Cleopatra VII was the last ruler of Egypt, yet she had female predecessors. Nefertiti and her mother-in-law, Tia, rule alongside their husbands. She was not content with the state of things. Queen Hatshepsut. She became one of the most powerful figures on the throne. About 300 years before her, Nofrisobek reigns over Egypt as the first female autocrat. Yet she too had predecessors, like Merinit. Merinit is queen around 2900 BC. When her husband dies, she has to take over the regency for her underage son. In doing so, she secures the pharaonic throne for him. He must have been very thankful for that because he built for her a magnificent tomb uh, near the tomb of the other rulers of that time in Abydos. For women in general, Merinit is one of the first ladies in ancient Egypt to rule the country. About 500 kilometers south of today's Cairo lies Abydos, burial place of the pharaohs from early dynastic times. Here in the year 1900, Egyptologists discover an impressive tomb complex. A stele gives the name of the tomb's owner, Merinit. At that time, researchers still consider Neat to be a male deity. Therefore, they initially assumed to have found the stele of a man. That of a male king. For the size of the complex is in no way inferior to tombs of other kings. In the center of the complex is a room with a wooden shrine. Around this burial chamber are grouped eight storerooms, which in turn are surrounded by 41 secondary tombs. The queen obviously did not go alone to the realm of the dead. In the first dynasty at Bydos, we have royal graves. But what's really strange is surrounding them are these subsidiary graves of lots of people, men, women, um, as well as in some cases, animals. And these seem to have been sacrificed, all of them, to go with the king 
to the afterlife. So it's like you're taking your court with you. And this only lasted for the first dynasty. The old kingdom begins with the third dynasty. It's also called the pyramid age. To many, it's the greatest era in the history of ancient Egypt. Administration continues to develop and becomes a model for states around the world. Its sculptors and architects refine its unique artistic style. It's the time of Kent Kaus I, a queen who seems almost forgotten. A world-famous site, the Three Pyramids of Giza. Only a stone's throw away, there's the so-called Fourth Pyramid of Giza. It's the tomb of Kent Kaus I, a queen of whom even the ancient Egyptians told many legends. No legend, however, is a relief in front of her tomb. It shows Kent Kaus with a Nemes headcloth and a ceremonial beard, the insignia of a king. So did she in fact rule over Egypt as king? Kent Kau is, has a text on her tomb. It's a pyramidal tomb. It's a huge tomb. And she calls herself either the mother of two kings of Upper and Lower Egypt, or one way to read it is the mother of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt and king of Upper and Lower Egypt. If that's the correct reading, then she was like an early Hatshepsut who became king in her own right. Yet, whether as ruler or regent, Kent Kaus apparently wields extraordinary power during her lifetime. She's in charge of the country's administration, economy, and even its military. With her tomb, she erects a monument to herself demonstrating her position. Initially, the complex is planned as a rock tomb. But then, her builders add a masterful-like step, until her tomb resembles the famous step pyramid in Saqqara. And as with other royal tombs, a ship is buried next to the pyramid. It's supposed to take Kent Kaus on her journey to the afterlife. The monumental tomb is meant to ensure eternal remembrance for its builder. Priests who live in houses right next to the tomb are to keep her memory alive. Even as a royal mother, Kent Kaus enjoys a prominent position. The mothers of divine heirs to the throne are considered to guarantee peace and stability, not least because they can take over the regency for their minor sons, if need be. Queens are closely associated with the sky goddess, Hathor, She's considered the mother of the falcon god Horus, who has been the patron god of the pharaohs since early dynastic times. Just as the king was the incarnation of Horus, the queen, the queen mother especially, if she had a child who was to become king, was the incarnation of Hat Hor, the mother goddess. Her name literally means the estate or the mansion of Horus. If she is the place of Horus, and she holds the potential new Horus, even just the potential for conceiving a new Horus, and Horus dies, and there's no other obvious legitimate heir to the throne, as the holder of the place of Horus, she can assume power. Statues of royal mothers show their potential. Some are clearly modeled on the goddess Hathor, on their laps, they hold the future heirs to the throne. As servants to Hathor, women even conquer another male bastion, the priesthood. From the fifth dynasty onwards, the number of Hathor priestesses rises significantly. One of them is Hetepet. She bears the sonorous titles, Priestess of Hathor, she close to the king and she who owns land. In 2017, her burial chamber is rediscovered. 
Its wall paintings show everyday scenes from her life. Represented more than life-size, Hetepet sits on an elegant seat and receives precious gifts. This kind of oversized representation was a definite statement. Usually it was reserved for the men of the elite who could afford to have a tomb built and decorated, as all this was of course very expensive. It was a clear demonstration of power and status, not least towards the other priests. Gradually, Hathor merges with Isis, the goddess of birth and rebirth. Isis takes over more and more of Hathor's functions, even her position as mother of Horus. Isis becomes the most famous deity of ancient Egypt and even beyond its borders. She'll be worshipped throughout the later Roman Empire. Isis is a goddess who has many facets and appealed to many people because she wasn't only considered responsible for this world, but for the afterlife too. Adoration for her became common across all strata of Roman society. As far away as the Roman provincial capital of Mainz, Germany, believers erected shrines to the goddess. There was a special rite practiced here for a certain time. People would inscribe lead tablets with wishes and curses. They're actually quite marvelous to read. One example calls for someone to die little by little. Finally, the eyes should also die and everyone should watch. So it's quite brutal. Or people would fabricate dolls in proper a voodoo manner, with needles stuck in the head and the body. Yet Isis is most popular because of her gentle side. As the caring mother of God, she becomes an icon. It's a representation that also finds its way into Christianity. Like with Mary, the mother of God, holding the baby Jesus in her arms. Along with Isis, one of the most important goddesses is Ma'at. As goddess of justice and order, she's the spiritual guide for every pharaoh. Other deities are responsible for what's considered masculine fields, such as the goddess of war, Sekhmet, or Seshat, the goddess of writing and bookkeeping. As early as the Old Kingdom, women rise in the state hierarchy. As the king's mother or as priestesses, they belong to the influential elite. Yet, there are even more ways for women to advance. Some upper-class women are given high offices. In the Sixth Dynasty, a woman named Nebet is appointed vizier, the second highest office in the empire. About the same time, the first known female physician in history appears, Pesachet. One of her titles is Chief of the Female Physicians. She probably teaches at the medical school in Sais, where women are trained primarily in gynaecology. A successful career was by no means limited to women of the high society. Those from lower classes could also make a career. It was common in those days for women of the elite to have an all-female staff of servants. These women then managed the estates of their mistresses as treasurers or overseers. To the Greek historian Herodotus, Egyptian society seems strange. In Egypt, the women go to the market and trade, whereas the men sit at home and weave, he notes in his histories. Paintings prove that women did indeed have their own stalls in the markets. Nevertheless, in ancient Egypt, trade is predominantly a male affair.
Yet a good number of occupations long considered typically male are also practiced by women. They brew beer or even run their own ships more than 4,200 years ago. Around 2,200 BC, the old kingdom ends in chaos. At least, that's what Herodotus relates almost 2,000 years later, so our information is not first-hand. Like that of the story of Nitocris. When her father, the pharaoh, is assassinated, Nitocris invites the perpetrators to a banquet in a specially built underground hall. She has water from a river piped into the hall and drowns the murderers. To escape punishment, Nitocris commits suicide, throwing herself into a fire. Nitocris is still a mystery for archaeologists, um, but uh, she has inspired uh, a lot of uh, artists, uh, a lot of um, uh, writers. Uh, so, uh, for instance, Tennessee Williams. But at the end, uh, for, as for historical facts, uh, there is uh, nothing much uh, to grasp. But the idea of the intrigue uh, surrounding uh, Nito Christ gives her this ambiance. In the wake of her death, the Egyptian state disintegrates. It's the beginning of the so-called First Intermediate Period. New centers of power emerge. Heracleopolis in the north. And in the south, there is Thebes. From here, King Mentuhotep II succeeds in conquering the north and thus reunifies the Egyptian empire. The first intermediate period is followed by the Middle Kingdom, a new period of prosperity for Egypt. It's the time of Nofrisobek, the first female autocrat on the Egyptian throne on record. For three years, 10 months and 24 days, she reigns alone as queen. Internal and external relations are stable under her leadership. Even Nubia in the south is firmly in Egyptian hands. The reasons for Nofrosobek's accession to the throne were not too glamorous. As a matter of fact, she was a stopgap. In the absence of male heirs, one simply resorted to a female family member, a practice that we know from European ruling families as well. Nafrosobek differed from her predecessors, such as Kenkaus or Merenith, because she legitimized herself by her own right, not as regent for a minor son. The royal titles she bore testifies to this. She is also mentioned in the king lists of Karnak and Saqqara. And as that had not been the case before, she became a model for later queens like Hatshepsut or Tausret. Alas, Nofrusobek fails to secure the succession. Leaving no male heir, a dispute over her throne ensues. Direct succession ensures peace and stability in the empire. Thus, the pressure to produce offspring is high, even in the lower classes, since children guarantee that the parents will be remembered. That's why childbearing is the most important task of women in Egypt, too. This may sound patriarchal, yet unlike in many other cultures, the birth of a girl is considered a blessing. The birth of a girl was always a source of joy and in no way to be seen negatively. If you look at Egyptian history as a whole, numerous princesses play a special role next to princes. And thanks to this, we see, albeit rarely, female pharaohs in ancient Egypt. With the onset of labor, the expectant mother is taken to what is called a postpartum bower. It's set up on the roof or in the garden of the house. When giving birth, the mother uses a birthing chair or bricks to support her during delivery.
the expectant mother places herself under the protection of Mezeknet, the goddess of childbearing. Men have to wait outside. Bringing children into the world is the business of women. On the day of birth, friends and relatives call with gifts. After birth, it's mainly the mother who takes care of the child. To remain mobile, she wraps the baby in a sling. When the child gets older, the mother carries it on her hip. Those who can afford it hire a wet nurse for breastfeeding. These women are cherished by their nurturing children and often shown close to them. In addition to the child's bodily welfare, the mother takes care of its upbringing and schooling and may represent her children in legal matters. From a legal point of view, women had equal rights even since the Old Kingdom. A woman could dispose of a property and bequeath it to her children. She could also exclude certain children from inheritance and she had equal rights before the court. In this will from the Middle Kingdom, a woman named Neshonzu settles her estate. She bequeaths her land to her son if he will take care of her burial, an arrangement that sounds surprisingly modern. So were there equal rights for women in ancient Egypt? Of course, we can't talk about equal rights in today's sense. The distribution of roles was simply still too classical. As mistress of the house, a woman primarily took care of the children and household matters or activities that could be performed in the household. Women in high administrative positions were rather an exception. However, these exceptions distinguish Egypt from ancient Rome or Greece. As Nofrusobek does not give birth to an heir, her death triggers the second intermediate period, which lasts almost 250 years. A period of political instability in which the empire once again breaks up into several small dominions. Around 1648 BC, the Hyksos, a people from the Near East, succeed in establishing their own dynasty in northern Egypt. For the first time, parts of Egypt are under foreign rule. With the conquest of the north by the Hyksos, the concept of rule enters a real crisis. One of the pharaoh's most important tasks is to defeat his enemies. Alas, he's still a child. His mother must keep order in his place. Queen Ahotep I takes charge of the military as well. In her tomb, there are ceremonial axes, daggers, and even the so-called gold of honor an ancient Egyptian order that's bestowed only on persons of exceptional merit. Ahotep reigns at the end of the second intermediate period. Political struggles and unrest shake the country. In the north, after about 100 years, the foreign Hyksos still rule. In this difficult time, Ahotep demonstrates true leadership. For many years, she keeps the Hyksos at bay until her son, Ahmosa, is old enough to ascend the throne. Ahotep can really be called the unifier of Egypt. She comes at a very difficult time. Her husband, Seknenre, is killed fighting the Hexos. Uh, and she has uh, to become uh, the ruler uh, in the place of uh, her minor son, Ahmosa I. At the time, where uh, there is a lot of uh, political uh, struggle and disorder in Egypt, she is able to uh, really uh, safely take the rule and hand it over to her son, Ahmosa. When Ahmosa ascends the throne, he succeeds in completing his mother's work. He drives the Hyksos out of Egypt for good. In gratitude, he honors his mother, Ahotep, not just with a golden medal. On a memorial stone, he is erected at the eighth pylon in Karnak. He praises her importance for Egypt. Praise the mistress of the land who guides the people, the king's wife and king's mother, the glorious one. She gathered the army, protected and united Egypt. The queen, Ahotep, long live she. Ahotep's son, Ahmosa, becomes first king of the new kingdom, 
arguably the most glorious era in ancient Egypt. He erects the last Egyptian pyramid. From then on, underground tombs are built. Near the Valley of the Kings is the funerary temple of Ahmose's descendant, Hatshepsut. Built by the most powerful and successful female pharaoh on the Egyptian throne. Hatshepsut's mortuary temple is one of the most beautiful and impressive structures left to us by the ancient Egyptians. Hatshepsut's rise begins when she marries her half-brother, Tutmosa II. After his early death, things seem to run their natural course. Since Tutmosa III, the heir to the throne, is still too young to rule, Hatshepsut takes over the regency. But then she goes one step further. She officially proclaims herself queen and rules alongside Tutmosa III, thus limiting the power of the young pharaoh. Hatshepsut leaves nothing to chance to substantiate her claim to rule. She decides to take an unusual step. Although she continues to use female epithets like daughter of Ra or lady of the two lands, she lets herself be portrayed more and more as a man, even with a royal ceremonial beard. Hatshepsut even has the story of her conception retold. On a relief in her mortuary temple, her version is carved in stone. According to it, the sun god Amun united with her mother to conceive her. Thus, she not only legitimizes herself as queen, but makes herself a living demigoddess. Under her leadership, Egypt experiences a period of prosperity. Her trade missions lead as far as the legendary land of Punt. They bring back wealth and rare luxury goods. It's been said luxury is the uh, father or mother of invention. This trade, um, you know, was, was a part of how the pyramids built Egypt, you know, by extending these roots way down into Punt for frankincense and myrrh, like Hatshepsut did. This was all part, it helped them, you know, it, it, it incentivized them to build great ships. All of this, you know, increased Egypt's infrastructure in terms of its, they, now they had seagoing vessels, not just Nile barge, transport barges. Trade is crucial for Egypt's wealth and power. By opening up new markets, Hatshepsut boosts the country's economy, the base of a stable empire. After reigning for about 21 years, Hatshepsut dies and is solemnly buried in the Valley of the Kings. Following her death, however, her memory is systematically destroyed. Hatshepsut's stepson, Tutmosa III, was long regarded as the one behind the annihilation of her pictorial representations. However, recent research dates the destruction into later times. Whoever it was, he did not succeed in erasing Hatshepsut's memory. With Hatshepsut begins the glorious era of the New Kingdom. Her successor, Tutmosa III, becomes a great warlord. Under him, Egypt reaches the greatest expansion of its history. Amenhotep III, however, is remembered primarily as a builder. He has numerous sanctuaries built. The Memnon Colossi near the temple of Hatshepsut are part of his mortuary temple. Yet beside him stands a powerful woman, his great royal wife, Tiya. Their special connection is shown in this colossal statue. Both are depicted as the same size. The message is clear. This woman is not a subordinate. She is a partner. 
Officially, Tia is merely Amenhotep's wife. Yet, for all practical purposes, she's his co-ruler. Together, they determine the fate of the empire on the Nile. When Amenhotep III declares himself a god, Tia appears as his female counterpart at his side. Tia is one of the important queens of the New Kingdom. This can be derived from the frequency of her appearance in effigies, from large statues down to the smallest jewelry. No queen before her is depicted as often as she is. And she's given a temple dedicated expressly to her, which is another honor bestowed on no queen before her. Her officials have large tombs built in her neighborhood, and they obviously have the resources to do that, resources that were supplied by the queen. She also appears in the diplomatic correspondence of the time. Foreign rulers writing to the royal court at Amana call the queen as a witness to certain events, so she must have had adequate knowledge about the political actualities of her time. Tia and Amenhotep have at least six children together, including Akhenaten, who goes down in Egyptian history as the heretic king. His wife Nefertiti becomes even more famous. Her immaculate bust turns her into an icon. Her name means the beautiful one has come. But where she actually came from remains a mystery to this day. She was probably a member of the Egyptian upper class. After his accession to power, Akhenaten fundamentally restructures the Egyptian empire. He disempowers the influential priests of the imperial god Amun. The new soul god is Aten, the sun disk. He founds a new capital, Akhet Aten, far away from Thebes, the seat of the Amun priesthood. From here, he and Nefertiti rule the land. Like her predecessor, Queen Tia, Nefertiti regularly appears together with her husband. Akhenaten and Nefertiti appear almost as inseparable. What's more, like Queen Tia, Nefertiti is shown in scenes that are unusual for queens, such as the slaying of enemies. While the king slays male enemies, Nefertiti is shown slaying female enemies. Finally, there's a crown that only she wears. No queen before her and no queen after her are depicted with such a crown. In Karnak, we see another telling detail in a temple where reliefs on the pillars show the queen sacrificing to the god Aten without her husband. This too is a novelty, that the queen may appear alone at rites. Together, the couple revolutionizes art. The so-called Amana style shows the royal family in their private surroundings for the very first time. They stage themselves as a kind of holy family. counter design to the traditional group representation of the Egyptian gods. At the same time, these images portray them as approachable and thoroughly human. It's a style that still seems amazingly modern. Nefertiti's end is as mysterious as her origin. She was long believed to have died in Akhenaten's 12th or 14th year of reign, or even to have been disowned by her husband. But then in 2012, archaeologists discover a crucial clue. In a quarry, they find an inscription from Akhenaten's 16th year of reign. It addresses Nefertiti as the great royal wife. Thus it's clear that she was alive at least until shortly before Akhenaten's death. However, this doesn't explain Nefertiti's mysterious disappearance from history and has led to much speculation. It has been assumed that she continued to rule independently under the name of Pharaoh Semenkare after Akhenaten's death, 
since some images show her with the crown of a pharaoh. About her end, nothing is known. Yet, her legendary bust, one of the most famous treasures of ancient Egypt, has made Nefertiti immortal and an icon of beauty. Beauty was highly important in ancient Egypt. However, it didn't just matter how one looked. A well-groomed appearance brought order to a person's natural state, and that's why it was important for women as well as for men. One of the most famous beauty features is the eyeliner, so typical for the ancient Egyptians. Apart from enhancing your makeup, it has a very practical purpose. The lead compound used for the coal protects the eyes from infections. Wigs are another popular accessory. They even serve for lovemaking, as texts tell us. To arouse her man, the Egyptian woman does not put on a fine negligee, but her wig instead. The importance of beauty is also shown by numerous funerary goods related to beauty care. such as ointment vessels, perfume bottles, combs or precious mirrors. It's nowhere better illustrated than in the tomb of Nefertari in the Valley of the Queens. On every pillar and on every wall, she's shown with different robes and pieces of filigree jewelry, objects of timeless beauty. And timelessness is an important asset for the ancient Egyptians. In politics, too. Akhenaten's successor, Tutankhamun, restores the rule of the old gods. Eleven pharaohs follow under the name of Ramses. The most famous of them is Ramses II. Under his reign, the biblical exodus from Egypt is said to have taken place. His numerous temples and colossal statues make him famous. Always at his side, the fairest of the fair, his wife, Nefertari. Nefertari and Ramses II are a true power couple. The pharaoh seems to know quite well what he has in his clever wife. Even if Nefertari does not rule as a pharaoh, like Hatshepsut, she commands extraordinary powers and great influence. For many years, the conflict between Egypt and its northern neighbors, the Hittites, has been simmering. At Kadesh, the two empires clash. For Ramses, the battle ends in a lucky draw. The Hittites are under pressure from the growing Assyrian Empire and seek peace with Egypt. After tough negotiations, Ramses II and the Hittite king, Hattusili III, conclude the first peace treaty in history not least thanks to the skillful diplomacy of Nefertari. Nefertari must uh, not only have been uh, a beautiful woman, but also a very intelligent woman. And uh, we have clear evidence that she uh, played a role in the negotiations for the peace treaty with uh, the Hittites as she was in charge of the correspondence with uh, the Hittite queen uh, Puduheba. So Nefertari played a crucial role in achieving the first peace treaty ever. A copy of it is hanging now in the building of the United Nations in New York. Being able to read and write hieroglyphics is far from being a commonplace skill in ancient Egypt. Only a few Egyptians mastered this art. In her tomb, Nefertari has herself depicted with a writing tablet before Toth, the god of scribes and science. The message is unmistakable. She is a scribe. Shortly before her death, Ramses honors his wife with a last gift. He has two temples built at Abu Zimbel in the south of the empire. 
One of them is dedicated to the goddess Hathor and to his beloved Nefertari. And her statues at the temple are not just as tall as those of Ramses. They're even a few inches taller. Ramses II must have adored Nefertari because he built for her a magnificent temple beside his own great temple in Abu Simbel. It seems that uh, she uh, died shortly after this temple was inaugurated. And this must have been a big blow for Ramses II. Although he must have had uh, dozens of women in his harem, Nefertari seems to have been the love of his life and uh, his support. Just a few years later, another woman ascends the throne, Tausret. At this time, Egypt is plagued by the raiding Sea Peoples. Then Ramses III succeeds in winning a decisive victory, recorded for posterity in his mortuary temple of Medinet Habu. Yet under his successors, Egypt experiences a severe economic crisis. With Ramses XI, the new kingdom descends into chaos and revolt. The third intermediate period begins. Egypt breaks up into two dominions. Apart from the high priests of Amun in the south, a Libyan dynasty asserts itself in the north. There too, women increasingly take over important posts. One of them is Neshons. In the 19th century, locals discover an extraordinary necropolis near the temple of Hatshepsut. Instead of a single tomb, they find a veritable depository of mummies, the so-called royal cachette of Daya el-Bahari. More than 40 sarcophagi are stored here to protect them from tomb raiders. The mummies of Hatshepsut, Tutmose III and Ramses II were brought here, and the mummy of Aneshons. Who is this unknown, buried among royals? As Steely reveals, Neshons bore titles usually reserved for men. Viceroy of Kush, Overseer of the Foreigners, and Priestess of Knum. This would have made her one of the most powerful women of her time. Not surprisingly, her funerary goods are of high quality, canopic jars of calcite, a finely scripted book of the dead, and glazed eusheptis. That she could afford them is confirmed by a decree that was placed in her grave, a kind of ancient Egyptian receipt. Yet Neshons is not the only woman holding extraordinary power in the third intermediate period. With the transition to the late period, a group of priestesses rises to royal dignitaries, the spouses of Amun. Twelve hundred years earlier, Amun becomes king of all gods. The center of his cult is the temple complex at Karnak, which continues to grow over the centuries. Karnak develops into the most important cult site and the leading economic center of Egypt. Karnak was like the Vatican of ancient Egypt. It's the sacred center. The high priest of Amun eventually, after the New Kingdom and into the late period, becomes almost equal to Pharaoh and then actually equal to Pharaoh and is eventually shown at a bigger scale than Pharaoh himself. So you, you have this, you know, interesting development where the gods become more powerful and the pharaoh less so. Yet the prosperous religious center of Karnak is no longer under the control of a man. In the tomb of Pabasa, the chief financial administrator at Karnak, paintings and inscriptions show that a woman was in charge here during the late period. As a spouse of Amun, she's supreme servant of the king of the gods and thus mistress of the riches of Karnak. The spouses of Amun are priestesses. They're considered wives of the highest god. Their task is to take care of the earthly needs of Amun. 
According to ancient Egyptian belief, he regularly descends from heaven to the temple. If he finds everything to his satisfaction, he will protect the land. Notably, during the 25th dynasty, under the rule of the Nubian kings, the spouses of Amun played a crucial role. They were mostly daughters of these kings and would rise to eminence, especially in the Theban Empire. As wives of Amun, they were of crucial importance, not just in religious matters, but also politically. Their power was indeed amazing and can be equated with that of modern religious leaders. Their influence in religion as well as in politics cannot be overestimated. In the late period, Amun's wives are at the zenith of their power. They perform ritual acts previously reserved for the pharaoh, such as the driving of the four calves. They appear in line with Horus and Isis, and thus at eye level with the gods. In the late period, after a succession of Libyan, Nubian and Assyrian rulers, Egyptians reclaim the pharaoh's throne. Yet the so-called Egyptian restoration remains an episode. In 525 BC, the Persians become overlords of the empire. After the Battle of Issos in 333 BC, Egypt falls to Alexander the Great. The late period ends. Now the Greek Ptolemies rule the empire on the Nile. A time for power-conscious women like Arsinoe II. She rules alongside her brother-husband Ptolemy II and bears the title King of Upper and Lower Egypt. During her reign, the Lighthouse of Alexandria is completed, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Yet no ruler will become as famous as Cleopatra VII. Her fate is inextricably linked with the fall of ancient Egypt. Cleopatra is perhaps the most publicized of all pharaohs. To this day, numerous myths persist about her. Yet what's behind the image of the man-devouring femme fatale with a penchant for powerful men? As a young girl, Cleopatra enjoys an education befitting her status. She becomes the favorite of her father, who appoints her his successor, to the chagrin of her younger brother, Ptolemy. After her father's death, she ascends the throne with her brother. Yet he wants to rule alone and banishes his now 22-year-old sister. Cleopatra, however, does not give up. In the midst of their power struggle, Julius Caesar reaches Egypt. Cleopatra succeeds in winning over the most powerful man of the Roman Empire. And her efforts pay off. She wins the battle for the throne. When Ptolemy XIII perishes while fleeing from Caesar, she finally achieves her goal. Cleopatra is now sole pharaoh. Cleopatra's goals were clearly set. She came to power at a time when Egypt was dependent on Rome. Yet, she wanted Egypt to remain an independent empire. The question is, how could both sides get as much as possible for themselves? I think she made the most of her opportunities and thereby helped Egypt to a last renewal of its fame and power. In 44 BC, Caesar is assassinated in Rome. Cleopatra is on her own again and shows the world that she is a capable ruler. Cleopatra proved a skilled politician. After Caesar's death, she had to reorient herself. She had to weigh who might benefit her most and how she could keep her position. And so she maneuvers very skillfully. She observes who would turn out to be the stronger party, that of Caesar's supporters or that of Caesar's murderers, who were at war with each other. And in the beginning, it was not at all foreseeable who would win. Once again, Cleopatra goes all in. 
She opts for an alliance with Mark Antony, but her luck has run out. The civil war among Romans engulfs the Pharaonic Empire and drags Cleopatra into the abyss. In 31 BC, she loses the Battle of Actium against Octavian, later known as the Emperor Augustus. Deciding her own end, she commits suicide on August 12, 30 BC, choosing death rather than be paraded as a trophy by the victor. Cleopatra VII was an extraordinary ruler for the Ptolemies because she seemed to have been interested in Egypt, had a sense of responsibility. She seems to have known Egyptian, the language, not just spoken in Greek. So she had a real appreciation and care for her country. And she did try and fight to keep Egypt intact and away from Roman rule. Cleopatra's death spells the end of the dynasty of the Ptolemies yet also the end of three millennia of ancient Egyptian history. The end of an empire where women could take their destiny into their own hands. Due to their social status, they enjoyed an astonishing array of rights and liberties. The myth of Egypt lives on, not least thanks to them since it's not just the tales of powerful men that keep the fascination for Egypt alive, there are also the stories of strong, extraordinary women.